Well, hello and welcome to the Psychedelic Diaries. I am your host, Ray Krishna. <clears throat> Do we have a good show for you today? We will be talking about pharmaceutical capitalism, New York State, and the psychedelic news, and of course, experiences on magic mushrooms. Ronan Levy, executive director of Field Trip, will be with us momentarily for a deep dive and a soul search. But let's get started as usual with a nugget and a noodle. In today's news nugget, a New York state of mind may soon become a psychedelic state of mind. New York legislators led by Democrat Pat Burke have just introduced a bill to legalize psilocybin treatment. And if they do, they'll join the state of Oregon at the tip of the spear. So we'll keep an eye on this one as the sausage is made. More exciting news, though, for psychedelics. And as for the noodle, something I've been noodling on of late is, is it better to have some people never do psychedelics? And I'm not talking about for medical reasons like schizophrenia. With perfectly healthy individuals, is it better for society at large to have some people that never go beyond the chrysanthemum? Something happens when you go deep and it can change you, at least temporarily. There's a phenomenon called detribalizing, where after psychedelic experiences, some people can pull away from typical constructs and affiliations. And it may be that after some trips to the fifth dimension, this detribalizing is just a stage, a temporary part of the process. And then you eventually retribalize. And personally, on my many trips, I have felt this paradoxical sensation where I'm much more connected to the world at large. And yet at the same time, I feel less interested in sports, news, social media. And that may sound like a good thing, but those are constructs that can bring us together. So is it better to live in a society that has some people that never question the nature of their reality? Gun to my head, I think everybody should have a chance to take a trip with Alice down the rabbit hole, but tough to say. Something to noodle on. Well, that's it for a nugget and a noodle. Our next guest is the co-founder and executive director of Field Trip, perhaps one of my top three favorite psychedelic companies, Ronan Levy. Welcome to the show. Thanks, man. And I'm, uh, I'm a little bit concerned that you actually say top three. Uh, <laughs> I have to eliminate two of those and then you can repeat that statement again, okay? Well, I'll tell you what, you have, uh, quite frankly, the most gorgeous design aesthetic of any of them by far. Yeah. Congrats on that. Thanks. I take well, no credit for the uh, design aesthetic whatsoever, but we have a fantastic team who knows what they're doing. The signs of a stage five leader giving all the credit elsewhere. Ronan, let's, let's dive right in. Uh, you have had success in cannabis. You founded and then sold Canvas RX to Aurora and now Field Trip is one of the big players, perhaps the big player in psychedelics. And I'm curious for you, you've seen cannabis, you've seen now psychedelics. What has surprised you about the psychedelics industry? I think the thing that's surprised me most is um, in the early days, so this is 2018, we're starting to figure out what we're doing uh, with psychedelics, where things are going. And one of the key insights and intuitions I had is that psychedelics are coming and they're coming fast, way faster than anyone would expect. At the time, mm -hmm. everyone's like, that's 10 years out, maybe. And I'm like, no, this is two to three, maybe. I said probably this is five years, maybe a little bit less. Uh, and uh, we're two and a half years in and psychedelics have gone mainstream. It's everywhere, you know, a Toronto Life magazine was on the cover of it had psychedelics the same month that LA magazine had psychedelics on the cover. Like this has gone mainstream, full culture, you know, it's, it's still early adopter stage, but it's happening and it's happening fast. And I think that's one of the things that surprised me is I bet on it happening fast, but this is even, even faster for my expectations. I appreciate that take. Actually, in 2018, we were looking at um, our AI technology kind of helps address anxiety, depression, and addiction. I, I saw that that was what clearly psychedelics also address. So I had one of our analysts look into it and um, see if there's any potential partners. And we couldn't find anybody in 2018. Maybe the, the search wasn't as, as deep as it could have been. But two years later, I, I couldn't believe it, the, the amount that this has grown. Um, yeah. and, and speaking of which, I think that's a testament to you, Ronan, and what you've done at Field Trip, as I mentioned, you guys have the best consumer-ready feel 
in the industry. And for my money, that's a crucial distinction because of course there's the medical use case, but there's a lot for the healthy people, for cognition, for creativity, for purpose. And I'm curious, you once told me that your company is not for the psychedelic enthusiast, for the psychonaut, it's for the broader public. And I appreciate that focus because it's difficult to get some people to change their view. And I'm curious for you, what is the elevator pitch for those on the fence? For, for field trip was the elevator pitch? Yeah, for field trip and, and maybe even just psychedelics at large. Yeah, sure. Uh, so field trip, you know, we're, we're really destined to be the, the global leader in psychedelics. And, and our goal, our mission is to bring more joy, wonder, and fulfillment into people's lives. It's, it's mm. really that simple. And I think psychedelics are a great path because here's the truth and here's the thing that most people have a hard time accepting, including me. You know, it's easy for me to say, but probably 90% of the time I forget it, which is there's no shortage of joy or wonder or fulfillment in the world. It's all out there. It's all there. <laughs> you are just closed off to it right and then that's true about love that's true about friendship that's true about happiness that's true about sadness it's true about everything we close ourselves off to all of these wonderful experiences out there because they're too raw they're too intense they're hmm. too unmanageable too most importantly out of control uh and we like control it feels good but i'm a I'm a big believer that the, the, the biggest lie we tell ourselves is that we're in control. And the biggest fallacy we tell ourselves is that we want control, even if we could have it. Um, and, uh, and so that's the beauty of psychedelics. It's not limited to psychedelics. You can open your mind to uh, your heart to all of these wonderful things around the world uh, through meditation. You could just be one of those lucky people who just can naturally receive love and wonder and all that kind of stuff like, really well. Or you can be more like probably the average person hard time receiving all of that wonderful stuff. And, and um, psychedelics are a great way to open yourself up to it. And so that's really what I want to achieve. And that's true if you're a PTSD patient, you're suffering with depression. It's also true if you're not. Uh, and I've just dealt with the normal traumas of everyday life of being a human. All of these things uh, alter our and close us down in some respects. And I think there's a lot of great things to happen that come from opening ourselves up. Um, and so that's what we're trying to do. Wow. Uh, I love that take. I hadn't heard that concept of your focus on opening up the world to joy, wonder, and fulfillment. And uh, sometimes it seems like you're a meditator. I'm as well. I've heard this idea that uh, the beginner's mind, where you've got uh, more of a childlike view towards the world, it's almost like our brain or our mind sees the world as uh, like a lantern. You see all at once, whereas adults, sometimes we get narrowed down and we see it like a flashlight. And I love that idea connecting to the fact that joy is here for us. The fulfillment, the wonder is there for us, but we have to kind of open up the lantern to see it. Uh, so I appreciate that take and, and uh, kind of dovetails into my next question for you, Ronan. I love how you said years ago, as you guys were launching Field Trip, we should probably get some hands-on knowledge with psychedelics as we launch Field Trip. And the fact that you went and tested it out, uh, I have a lot of respect for you for doing that, even though you weren't really, I, I don't think, a psychonaut at that point. Ronan, what did that experience on psychedelics do for you? Uh, you're correct. We I tried psychedelics once or twice prior to that time, but both times at a party while well, incredibly drunk. And so whatever <laughs> the effects were, were lost in, in the milieu of different chemicals running through my brain at that point. Uh, so in 2018, when we learned about what was happening with psychedelics and the science around it, we're like, okay, if we're going to do something here, we need to know what we're getting into. It would be disingenuous to go out there and say, hey, here's this wonderful treatment option that everybody should try, but have no hands-on experience. And to be clear, I'm yes. not a person who thinks every psychedelic therapist needs to have psychedelic experience. I think there's people out there whose capacity and EQ is one that enables them to understand and empathize pe with people, whether they've had a psychedelic experience or not. Most people probably would benefit from having done it before they offer to become a psychedelic therapist, but I don't think it's an absolute requirement. But certainly when we were starting, we're like, this is significant. It's impactful. It's scary. Um, you know, and, and if done wrong, it could probably do a lot more damage than it can benefit it can create. And, and so we want to make sure that this is something we wanted to dedicate our time and our money and our reputations towards and so yeah we we <laughs> went and we, i took one gram of psilocybin mushrooms at our office um and it was awesome you know in in many respects it was 
what I expected having done meditation and having had at least a couple of really deep, pretty transcendent meditation experiences. Like I had a kind of gut sense of what it was going to be like. Uh, and it was, but you know, orders of magnitude, more interesting, more fun, more introspective. And I think the, the most powerful part of that experience was at the time we had just left Aurora and we were in a bit of a dispute. I don't even know what the right word is, but like there was, there was some lingering tensions that were unresolved. And as we look back on what had transpired, we felt confident that we had acted with sincerity, um, with uh, propriety and, and done the right things, but they're still pissed off at us. And so there's that kind of disconnect being like, we did the right things, but you guys are still pissed off. It's not fair. And towards the end of that trip, I had this distinct sensation of putting myself in the shoes of the people at Aurora, the executive management at Aurora who were kind of pissed off at us. And I'm like, oh, I get it. Like it was a true empathetic experience in that it wasn't like, oh yeah, I can see why you're upset and again, you know, logical up in the brain, but like on a deep kind of visceral emotional being like, yeah, I get it. I understand why you're pissed. I can still tell you all the 10 reasons why I think you're wrong in taking that perspective. <laughs> get it it's like you feel you feel like you were wronged and and there's nothing i can do on a logical basis to say here's why you weren't wrong to address that and mm. i thought that was the most powerful thing because that is true empathy being like there's no logical way to understand what you're experiencing but i can feel it and i get it and and you know talk about the ineffable that's the ineffable right there's there's no way to properly articulate it other than to say i get it so uh, it was it was a great experience uh, overall, and uh, you know it set us on the course to building field trip. Hmm. You know, Ronan, there's a few people out there where in my mind I'm just like I'm glad that they're out there. I know that this person is alive and they're out there doing stuff. And for instance, Dave Chappelle is one of them. One of my favorite artists is this guy Gala Matias. I'm like I'm just glad they're out there doing stuff. I would yeah. even put Bill Maher in there. And you're you're one of those guys. Because you are, for my money, it's like you're, you're kind of this uh, philosopher king where you're a lawyer, you've, you've done a, a VC, you've done the startup route, you've seen both sides of that coin, but also you have uh, more than enough knowledge on um, the spiritual and uh, this, this concept of purpose and doing these deep meditations and diving into the psychedelics. And I'm curious for you because I've gone through the process of I've sold a product before, a product line, uh, and I've tried to sell a company before, and it's really hard. And you kind of think to yourself, okay, once I sell it, it's like, okay, George Bush, mission accomplished, we did it. And I appreciate that share that afterwards there was just this prickly feelings. And, and one quick follow-up to that is looking back at that situation with Aurora, what do you think you would have done differently? Uh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think I would have done anything differently. Um, mm. You know, here, here's the truth of the matter is that you can act with principle and still hurt people. Right. And, and I remember yes. one of the key learnings I came across from, you know, working with Irwin, who's the teacher guide guru. He's not a psychedelic therapist. I, I don't know. It's hard to articulate what he is, but um, he said, um, people can, you can, people can be hurt by, actions without you hurting them which is a really profound thing which is as long as you act consistently with your, your own principles and for your own purposes and for the right reasons your actions may result in someone being hurt oops but you did not hurt them right hurting them involves some sort of intent or not so it doesn't mean you can't be empathetic and say i am sorry you feel hurt for this uh, but you can rest in, in good conscience, knowing that you didn't hurt them. And, and, uh, and so when I go back to that situation with Aurora, it's like, yeah, we acted with principle and you guys were hurt and, and that is okay. And that's one of the big learnings that I've had to deal with. Um, you know, uh, I appreciate the kind words you said about me in many ways. I can talk the talk, but sometimes walking the walk is really hard, which is to say, I, I, I know a lot of this stuff, but you know, and, and, yeah, I've sold a business and, and the lesson I learned from that is be careful for what, what you wish for because you just might get it. And I'm not the only one I've spoken to who's had the experience of you sell a business, you make some money, all of a sudden you're like, oh, my problems are all gone. And then you realize your problems are still there. 
But now you don't have that narrative or that story you can sell yourself being like, oh, no, if I just make, if I just do this next, then, then my problems are all gone. All of a sudden you don't have that. Oh, if I just do this next, I don't, you know, I don't have that excuse for why I'm not happy anymore because I've now achieved that thing that was supposed to make me happy. And so you don't have happiness and you don't have that excuse. You don't have that lie anymore about like, oh, that'll just make me happy if I just get this. And that's really hard. Um, and you know, one of the things that I, I struggle with to this day is like having a sense of self-worth, you know, the struggles I have in my friendships and my relationships and, and going back to like the distinction between hurting someone and someone being hurt by it. It's still really hard for me to have someone be hurt by my actions mm-hmm. because I'm worried that they're no, no longer going to love me. They're no longer going to want to be my friend or my partner or, or whatever. And it makes it really hard to live your life knowing that, even acting with principle, you can still get fucked, you know, to some, excuse my language, but like to some degree and, and, and not in the way of like someone screwed you over, but like something being taken away from you, or at least thinking that something's going to be taken away from you. So it's like, yeah, I can, I can go out there and be like, yes, I could, Alex, I can give you so much wonder and joy and, and fulfillment in the world. And the answer is they can, but I look at my life and I do have a lot of joy and a lot of wonder and a lot of fulfillment, but I have a long way to go to, um, that's for sure. Uh, and I still struggle with a lot of the issues that everybody else struggles with, even though on paper, I may look like a, a resounding success. You ask me on a deeply emotional level, if I'm a success, like on an honest level, and I'll look at you in the end and I'll say, absolutely not. Uh, and that's like a genuine feeling. Like it's, it's not because I can't logically say, sure. Yeah. On paper, I'm a total success inside, you know, I, I don't feel it. And, and that's one of the things that I've got to struggle and, and work with and work through and, and try to, to try to rectify. Wow. That is beautiful. And uh, I appreciate that vulnerability. And I completely relate. There are still times where I'm really struggling with the imposter syndrome. And I, I wonder, am I a complete asshole at times? And I'm like, you know, maybe you have asshole behaviors, but no, you're not. And I love that idea of acting with principle, you're still going to hurt people. I feel like I've had a realization once where it's like, even if you do everything in the best possible, most comprehensively good way, you're going to at least once or twice be seen as the villain. And that's kind of a tough pill to swallow. One last little follow-up to that. Future Ronan, he's getting ready to close a deal to sell a company, field trip or something else. What's one little nugget you'd give him? Uh, I would say... Don't go nuts. It's good advice also for not for following psychedelic experiences. Like don't go nuts and buy a whole bunch of shit and feel like uh, you've made it. Like take your time, free, appreciate the success, you know, really appreciate the success. And then, you know, be conscious because just because you may have got a, a new bucket of money sitting beside you. Um, and, and this is something I still struggle with to this day. It's like, it's not, it's not the number that matters. You can have a billion dollars. And I, 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 I'm sure that if you spoke to a billionaire on days where their billion dollars goes to 9.99 billion, or like their $1 billion goes to $999 million, which is still an absurd amount of money, they will feel poor. And the days it goes up to $101 million or $1.1 billion, whatever the number is, they'll feel rich because it's not the number. It's like you hit a plateau. There's the excitement. There's the satisfaction. You hit a plateau. It's like, oh, I've got all this, but that no longer satisfies. If you're still using external validation, like the size of your bank account to find your own sense of self-worth, as soon as this goes down, you lose self-worth. And as soon as it goes up, you gain self-worth. Your your self-worth is tied to an external factor. Um, and, uh, as soon as that happens, life becomes challenging. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It's good. If it's going down, it can totally destroy you on the inside. And if it's going up, you're going to have elation. Like no one's ever experienced, but yeah, it, it's not, it's a roller coaster. And I think most people at a certain point when they realize that it's a roller coaster, want to get off and like, this has been enough of a ride. I just want to find peace and some tranquility and some wonder and go fish and be happy that way. Um, uh, so that's the advice I'd give to Ronan in the future is about to close a deal. Is like, don't don't lose the path. Don't think, you know, this is going to solve the problems that the last time selling a business didn't solve. Uh, you still got the work to do. <clears throat> well put. Yeah, sometimes the roller coaster, you need a break and it's time to jump on the teacup ride for a little bit of a quieter ride. Uh, well, spinning <laughs> rides really make me want to pick something on the teacup <laughs> ride. <laughs> Fair enough. So maybe a quieter ride than that. But uh, switching gears a little bit, Ronan, um, you're a meditator as well. And you alluded to it. 
uh, with these, you said you had some transcendent experiences with meditation. And I, I've found that, or I felt that uh, it's almost like meditation and psychedelic experiences are brother and sister, where mm -hmm. the psychedelics are kind of the big brother. They hit, they slap a little harder, more intense, but they're the same, they're the same family. And I'm curious for you, what is it about both meditation and psychedelics that seems to help build a deeper sense of community? That's a good question. Um, you know, certainly with psychedelics, I think people come out of it with a deep sense of appreciation for what, you know, philosophers have been talking about for a long time, which is that we're, we're all interconnected. You know, everyone, you've, you've certainly heard the expression, we're like, we're all just stardust and we are literally just stardust, right? Um, all of the chemicals that make up our body are stardust. Um, and the notions of separation tend to disappear, particularly during a psychedelic experience. Um, you just become hmm. much more aware and conscious on, on an embodied level, you know, going back to that conversation about empathy, it's like, you know, you feel it on a different level, certainly during psychedelics, and it can happen during meditation, that, that, that logical recognition of there being no difference between you and me, that we're all interconnected. That is actually true. You know, we are all interconnected. Like where um, my skin is talking, talking, touching oxygen molecules and air molecules that are touching you, Ray, wherever you are, we are touching each other on some level. Um, easy to say logically, but to be like, wow. And, and really found, find the profound in that is, is challenging. Uh, but during a psychedelic experience, it's not. And I think that's why people are like, oh, we are all connected. We are all one that comes out of a psychedelic experience and that builds community. There's nothing more, I think, that builds community than realizing that you're connected to every other person and thing on this planet. Well put. I completely agree. Um, stepping back a little bit to the broader experience on psychedelics, uh, Ronan, my five-year journey uh, where I basically did magic mushrooms once a month um, full dose, somewhere between two and four grams. It really changed me. Like, oh, I was a decent guy, decent career, and but something different happened to my cognition, my creativity, and most importantly, my sense of purpose. And um, I appreciate your share about um, what you've seen on meditation and psychedelics. What has your journey been like with psychedelics? Or uh, if you feel like uh, it may change in the near future, what do you think your journey will be like in the coming years? I don't know, to be quite honest, I haven't thought about that too much. My journey to date has been, I've done a lot of work as, as may be uh, evident on myself, even without psychedelics in terms of metaphysics, meditation, um, therapy, coaching. So I'm, I'm aware, <laughs> I'm pretty, pretty conscious of, of, of my shit. Um, and so my experiences on psychedelics have offered some illumination uh, and offered some shifts. Um, but I think that's one of the, um, one of the maybe misnomers about psychedelics is that like psychedelics are going to fundamentally change your life. Um, you know, you're going to have one big ayahuasca thing and like everything's going to be different. And, and, and in some cases that happens, but for most of us, it's kind of like every experience just moves us like 1%. And if you think what happens, it's like you just move 1% and with time, that 1% expands and expands and expands and you're very yes. different. So maybe in 10 years, you can draw the line back to that psychedelic experience in 2000, at the end of 2021, you're like, oh man, that changed everything. But if you looked at it in January, if you're like, yeah, it's a cool experience and I learned some stuff, but you know, it, it, I, I don't know that it was life-changing, but if you move it forward. Um, and so that's kind of where I am, which is like, I'm not looking for life-changing, like eye-opening experiences. I'm, I think I'm pretty much like conscious of what's going on now. It's about letting it be real and healing those things that stop me from letting more joy, wonder, and fulfillment into my life. And, and so each psychedelic experience, I think it's just like a little step in that direction. Mm -hmm. Like, And if everyone just like changed or healed or became more conscious 1% um, today, you know, the, the world would be different uh, in five years. Uh, it'd be so different. Uh, and so that's the path I'm on. That's my future, which is just like continuing to make progress uh, and feeling like I'm making progress. That was actually one of the biggest insights that I have never, never had, not with any psychedel psychedelics or anything uh, along those lines. Uh, but I remember when I finished articling, which is a, I don't know if it's in the US, but in Canada, after you finish law school, you basically get underpaid to be a lawyer for a year as an articling student. And then they let you become a lawyer. Um, I was miserable during that year. And mm. I had this realization on, on, January 2nd of 2005, I think it was, 
that it doesn't matter if you achieve your goals, as long as you feel like you're making progress towards them, you'll find happiness. Um, and so, you know, along those lines, what is my psychedelic future hole? Just making progress, uh, whatever that looks like. I don't know, but just feel like I'm making progress. Yeah, progress brings you happiness. And I think what you guys are doing with your ketamine, with the clinics, with your drug development, and uh, maybe soon with psilocybin, um, or some analog, you really are making the world a better place, perhaps at that 1%. So thank you for being one of those guys, the tip of the spear guys right. and what you're doing, you're making a big impact on the world. And um, speaking of that, uh, you said, uh, I heard you say once that capitalism is good at giving people what they want. And I, I love the take, Ronan, because it's not evil to make money. It's okay to make money and on psychedelics and on, um, you know, dissociatives, whatever the product is. And I'm curious for this one, speaking of giving people what they want, do people know what they want? Or is this kind of like a Steve Jobs? No, we're going to make an iPhone because we know people will want it, even if they don't know it yet type of situation with psychedelics. That's a good question. Um, do people know what they want? Uh, I think deep down intrinsically, yes. But I think we get distracted by so many things in life. Um, but I think at the end of the day, people want love. Uh, I think they want to feel secure. Uh, I think they want to have fun. And, uh, you know, obviously have food and, and clothing and shelter and those basic necessities. Uh, and, and that's it. You know, if you need people that, I think people would be very, very, very content. Um, but it's often hard to sort of become aware of that. And it's so easy to think like I did and like many people do that, oh, I'll be happier. I'll have like fulfillment if I just have more money because then I don't have to worry about all that kind of stuff. And, and that's, that's an artificial um, measure for, for it, right? You, you know, so many people like myself, you make some money and it's like, well, I didn't change a goddamn thing. I just have more expensive lifestyle, but my, my demons still haunt me exactly the same way. Mm. Uh, uh, so yeah, I do think people know what they want. Um, deep down, I think the more real question is like, do people know how to achieve those things? And, and mm. in such a busy, complex, exciting, dynamic world, it's easy to lose track of or not be sure uh, how to find those things. Hmm. Well, speaking of knowing how to find things, you have taken a law career and parlayed it into an entrepreneurial path and obviously with your uh, investment company as well. As a lawyer, a bunch of my best friends are lawyers. And uh, personally, I think they get a bad rap. I love the, the specificity. I love the precision in the writing. And I love the analytical mind that comes with a law degree. And I'm curious for you as a lawyer and an entrepreneur, Ronan, what is one way that your law experience has helped you as an entrepreneur? And then conversely, what is one habit that your law degree taught you that you kind of had to tamp down to be a good entrepreneur? So I'm a very atypical lawyer, um, which is I love regulatory risk. One of the big insights I learned in my career is that good lawyers don't tell you what risk to avoid. They tell you what risk to take and knowing yeah. exactly where the line is. And when it comes to most regulatory risk, I'm a big believer that most regulations have good intentions, but are poorly executed. Um, hmm. And so if you're choosing to maybe push the line on a regulation um, uh, or even cross it, you know, that's okay for, for as provided two things happen. One is you understand where the actual line is because there's the letter of the law and then there's where it actually gets enforced, which are two different places. And then there's the principle, which is like, okay, I may be choosing to step across a regulatory line, but is it violating the spirit or the intent? Is it harming people? And if the answer to the second question is no, it's not, you know, it's perfectly consistent with like a, a valid moral perspective. And secondly, like I can cross it and, and, and not get in trouble. It's like, that's what a good lawyer does. That's what lawyers been like, yeah, yeah, that's your business objective. That's your personal objectives. Here's how you do it. It doesn't matter that it's not on side the law. Now, uh, could that get me disbarred? Sure. But I think most, you know, Elon Musk just had a, a great quote and I'm, I'm going to um, misstate it, but he was basically saying we have like a whole thousands, thousands, if not millions of pages of laws and regulations that have just been built up over time, over time, over time, over time. Well-intentioned, but they've just become so unwieldy and they've so lost connection to their original intent, but there's no 
process in government or lawmaking to clear the slate and start over. It just gets on top of each other. And so it's like, so we have such a terrible, terrible legal system, uh, well-intentioned, but the one thing I've become quite clear of, and, and I've become fairly libertarian, I think, in my old age, is that good intentions, but poorly drafted, uh, lead to bad laws. Um, and we got tons and tons of those. And like a, a stupid, simple example was um, after 9-11, there was all these regulations put in on airplanes um, that you had to be able to lock the cockpit, right? Well, it makes a lot of sense. You don't want someone hijacking a plane by running into the cockpit with a knife and taking over the plane. We don't want to repeat 9-11. Right, great intention. Uh, and then sometime about five or six later, five or six years later in Germany, um, the pilot got up to go to the bathroom, the co-pilot who was depressed, locked the door, locked the pilot out and flew the plane into a mountain. Um, and it's just like one of those things being like, that was a really thoughtful idea, but not fully thought through, you created an issue where someone else died, right? And it's like, you see that all the time with laws that like in regulations, like good idea, but you're just creating more and more follow on circumstances that it has to be, you know, dra drafting legislation has to be done with like precision and, and a scalpel. And too often it's created in circumstances where it's done reactive, like something bad happens. Uh, and then, you know, pol politicians feel like they have to react and do something. And so they draft poorly, poor laws, poorly drafted. Um, and so we end up uh, with a whole bunch of laws. Sorry, I got way off on a tangent. The point being what, what a lawyer uh, has taught me is like, being okay with knowing when to cross the line um, and take appropriate risks, and uh, what uh, what I you know has hampered my entrepreneurial career as a lawyer. Um, I don't think it happens that much anymore. But there's anytime it, you want to do something new, there's a million billion reasons you can find to not do something. Mm. Uh, and as a lawyer who's very analytical, it's very easy to come up with all the reasons to not do something. Um, and that probably stunted a lot of opportunities that I may have pursued in the past, but I've, I've gotten past that. And I know it's like, wherever you start, it's not going to work and end up. It's not where you're going to end up. So just start and start moving forward and you'll look, learn your path and, and uh, things will become clear as you learn. So just, just start. Um, and uh, I know a lot of lawyers would be, become entrepreneurs if they could but they can't start because they can't get past their own analytical minds to find all the reasons that they shouldn't do it in the first place wow well put i totally agree the laws can turn into a frankenstein situation very quickly and you reminded me one of my favorite quotes is there are rules some can be bent others can be broken be curious to figure out which is which. <laughs> so Never Ronan- The line is crossed until you cross it. Yes, yeah, another one of my favorites. Okay, Ronan, we got to switch over to the soul search. So question number one, Ronan, you are on a desert island and you only get one mind altering substance. You're there by yourself for 10 years. What is the one substance you go with? I would choose probably cannabis. <laughs> Question number two, Ronan, who is one person that has had a profound impact on your career? Uh, the CEO of a uh, online dating company I worked for, he got into a lot of bad shit and like there's a lot of lessons of what not to do, but he was the one who taught me that uh, the, the world is yours. You just have to find out where the, the limits are, where the lines are. Um, and, and that really in, influenced my, my perspective and inspired me to take a lot of chances that I probably never would have up to that point. <laughs> uh, that's beautiful. Uh, number four, final question, Ronan. Uh, excuse number me, number three. Number three, number three you're right. Uh, so you get to relive the life of any historical figure. Who you got? I've always been curious about what it was like, not to be Jesus, but to live in the time of Jesus, see what exactly happened, because so much of human history has been premised on those like 30 years years that I would love to be, you know, either not Jesus probably, but maybe one of his disciples watching exactly what happened. Being one of Jesus' disciples. That is one of my favorite answers to that question. Okay. The real number four, final question, Ronan. Would you rather have someone's curiosity or their attention? Curiosity. <clears throat> totally agree with you. Okay. Well, that's all the time we have. Ronan, uh, thank you for being on the show. You've been a great guest. 
uh, to all the viewers and listeners, go check out Field Trip. Perhaps inquire about a ketamine visit. Last little question for you, Ronan. Um, what are you excited about coming up here soon for Field Trip? Uh, there's a lot of things on the go. Uh, but for me, you know, it's, it's less about what we can do through Field Trip as like a business and more what kind of impact that we can have. So I was recently invited to uh, attend uh, Davos where the, where the World Economic Forum is happening. It's not the actual World Economic Forum, but like one of the main, main side events, which is awesome. We're working on documentary, which I think is going to hopefully open a lot of people's eyes and minds to exactly what's happening. Um, and so really, for me, it's about getting the narrative out there and, and really opening people up to the conversations that you and I are having right now. Uh, and so there's a lot of things in the works that are going to enable that. What's one action item you would have for the viewers? One action item is start listening to Field Tripping the Podcast. If you found anything I've said in this conversation insightful or, insightful or at least thought-provoking, there's a lot of that on, on our podcast, and I'm really hoping to build that platform to, again, just spread the word, you know, get people thinking and talking. That, that's my goal. We just did a, an episode with Michael Pollan that we named This Is Your Mind on Michael Pollan, and I realized what I want to achieve with the <laughs> podcast is help people see the world through another person's eyes. You know, that's really what empathy is, and then I think I do that through the podcast and educate them about psychedelic. Uh, and then I will be very content. And so the, the podcasting is called Field Tripping. Uh, you can visit it or, or find all the links to it at fieldtripping.fm. Um, and on any kind of other platforms, if you're interested in Field Trip, fieldtriphealth.com is our website. At Field Trip Health is our uh, social handle. And my personal one is at Ronan D. Levy, Ronan David Levy uh, on, on Instagram and Twitter and all that kind of stuff. Fantastic. Okay. We will get those links in the description. Go check out the podcast. Go check out fieldtrip.com. Ronan Levy. Apologies. Fieldtriphealth.com. We'll get that correct in the description. Uh, I really believe you are a philosopher king and thank you for being one of these tip of the spear guys, really moving the industry along. Thank you for joining the show. It's been great to have you. Thanks for having me. It's been a pleasure chatting with you. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of the Psychedelic Diaries. I am Ray Christian. See you next time. Thank you.